Welcome to Sonoma Kids Ask the Experts. This is the very first episode. I'm your host, Kat Smith. I am a radio host at KSBY, and today I have Dr. Jerome Smith with me, who is going to answer some questions, and how did this come about? I'm going to start the timer real quick, just to make sure we don't run out of time. And I have an 11-year-old in my house that is constantly asking me questions, and I can't answer them. So I thought, why don't I get all the questions of the fifth graders and ask experts themselves. So I thought the very first step should be a doctor because there's a lot of questions about why we're staying home and what we're doing and all about the COVID-19 and our health and where did it come from. And so we're just going to jump in and ask some questions of Dr. Smith. Welcome. Thank you. Do you want to give us just a little brief bio? Well, I'm a pediatrician here in town and I've been here for 13 years, working part of the time in the health center and part of the time in my office. I got my uh, medical degree back east and then my public health degree down at UCLA. Cool. And I know that a couple of the kids were really excited because I hear they might be patients of yours. I won't disclose who they were because they probably shouldn't have told me, but <laughs> it's just, I just can't tell you. Okay. Can, All right. I can neither confirm nor deny. Well, they all say hi. <laughs> hi, guys. Okay, so the first question we have, so the question that was asked of the children was, thinking of the coronavirus, COVID-19, what questions do you have for Dr. Smith? And they could ask you anything they wanted to, but they really kind of stuck direct to this one virus, I think. And you've seen the question, so I think you'll agree. Um, our first question is from Oren, who's age 11, who wants to know, how was COVID-19 made? That is a great place to start. Well, let's back up one step, talk about what are germs. We know germs is kind of a word we throw around. Germs can be viruses. Germs can be bacteria or fungus or parasites, like molds and stuff. Um, viruses are different than those other groups because they're not full living cells. They can't, they can't multiply, reproduce, and go on without hijacking uh, uh, another uh, organism cells like us. So they have this oily coat that, by the way, both soap and alcohol can destroy. And um, they try to get into you, multiply, sort of live off of your machinery, your cells' ability to reproduce, to keep living. And the coronavirus family that we're going to talk about gets its name from its shape under a very powerful microscope. It looks like little spikes are coming out from a crown, like an ancient medieval crown. And some of you know that corona means crown in um, Spanish and, of course, in Latin where a lot of medical words come from. This family, the four most popular ones that we know about are some of the very viruses that cause the common cold, mostly in the winter. Other viruses do too, but this family is notorious. There are other ones that have caused smaller and more dangerous outbreaks that you hear about once in a while, like what we're having now. So this one we think most likely started out because of its genetic code, kind of its recipe, we think that it most likely started out as a bat virus that usually doesn't infect humans, but it, it got passed through to another animal and then it changed or mutated and then suddenly it could infect humans. This one's a very close relative of the SARS virus that happened a few years ago. So it's called SARS-CoV-2, um, sars coronavirus number two, because it's the second one. And the disease that we get from it is called COVID-19 because it was first noticed at the very end of last year of 2019, and that was in China. So the so next- it kind of itself, And it changed from something else that had already been brewing around, but it wasn't until it infected us that humans kind of noticed. Right, right. And uh, the next question is from McKenna. Hi, McKenna, I know you, age 11, and she wants to know, do you think that COVID-19 was planned? Well, this is a great question. Strong no on this one. Why now then? You know, why suddenly did this come about? about? Well, viruses are actually around all the time. Some cause infection in humans and some in other animals. Um, some hardly ever change, like the measles virus, same old, same old for hundreds of years. Others, like the flu, change every year. So these changes we call mutations. And when the mutation makes it uh, able to harm humans suddenly, we sort of take notice. It makes us feel bad as we try to fight it off. This virus has already mutated a few times, actually, just ever so slightly. So scientists can use those little mutations to show which ones came before the others, kind of like your, your family tree or the branches of a tree. So we know kind of how far back we think this went um, based on 
sort of how it's changed in different places in the world. So the next question, um, three children all had around the same uh, question. So Aaron, age 10, and Jack and Stella, ages 11, uh, they want to know, how does it spread so quickly? Why is it so contagious? Also a great question. So this virus now spreads person to person. And so some viruses, as you all may know, can infect your stomach and intestines and make you feel queasy and cause you to have vomiting and diarrhea, and they kind of exit their host that way and spread to other people that way. Others like colds and flu leave your body, your, their host, when you cough or you sneeze, and then they get breathed into someone else's mouth or nose um, from someone nearby, or maybe picked up on your hands when they land on nearby surfaces. So then that hand touches your eyes, your nose, or mouth, and it's found a new home. And COVID seems mostly to work like that. And viruses are very, very tiny. So um, the way the virus transmits kind of helps us to figure out how to stop it. So you'll hear words thrown around if you're sort of reading about COVID about airborne and droplet. And airborne basically means they're so, so tiny that they kind of float around for a little while. And droplet means they're heavy. So gravity, even though we can't see them, they're heavier than the little ones. So they kind of drop down and land on stuff like surfaces. So this is a very important distinction that scientists sometimes make because it tells us how best we can protect ourselves and protect our families. So then Sahara, age 11, wants to know why it's harder for children to catch the virus than adults. That's a very interesting question. One of my favorite questions, I think. Um, it is possible that kids and adults catch the virus like about the same levels, you know, the same number of kids and adults, but we've noticed that with this virus anyway, kids have very fewer symptoms than the adults do. And there are lots of theories about why that is. Some scientists think that because kids are younger, their immune systems are still more active and able to kind of stop it before it gets old. Also, sort of as we age, we get different other diseases that make us sort of sicker, make little things make us look sicker and feel sicker, and um, sometimes even overreact to certain viruses or, or our immune systems fighting that virus. So it may not be so much that it's harder for the kids to catch, but that it's harder for the kids to feel sick from it. And then Emma, who is also age 11, she wants to know, how do cats get COVID-19? Ah, so there was a story about uh, I think tigers in a New York zoo, and they think that that tiger got it from a zookeeper. A couple of the cats were sick. They all had the same zookeeper, and probably the same way it's passed to us, you know, maybe it was... He sneezed on the tiger or it was on his hands or who knows. Um, that's what we think. That's how, what we think that cats get it. I mean, if bats can get it and other mammals can get it, it stands to reason that it could infect some other species. But that's really the big story. We haven't seen a wide um, news articles about pets coming down with it. So I don't think you have to worry about your little cat at home. And I think if you're feeding a tiger in a zoo, you should probably try to keep your hands away from their mouths anyways. <laughs> I think that would be a very strong idea. <laughs> um, and this is a similar question. Madison, age 10, wants to know, if an animal were to get it, are you able to tell if they're symptomatic or not? Well, I, I don't know a whole bunch about the animals that have gotten sick, except to tell you that the cats, I think when they, um, they'll sneeze, Sometimes the animals won't eat like they usually do, kind of like taking care of babies, which I do sometimes. They can't tell me either, but they can show you in other ways other than just measuring their temperature. So that's, I think, how they started to notice that this cat and its other cats were sick. And I haven't heard any cases of dogs yet, but I do notice that you don't always notice when your dog is sick, but you might notice things that they're doing that they don't normally do, like maybe sleeping extra or not eating their food. And with babies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You work with a lot of babies. <laughs> um, so now we have Jacqueline who wants to know, do masks really help? And a similar question from Jordan, why do we only cover our face? Ah, so let's talk about prevention. So masks, as you know, they cover your nose and mouth and they keep your germ in. Because remember, we talked about how the germs come out of your mouth and nose when you cough or sneeze. And it also covers them to remind you not to touch your infected hands if you had them on your hands. 
you would not um, touch your mouth and your nose, you'd hit the mask first. Now your eyes don't sneeze or cough, as you know, but um, we also recommend hand washing to keep your hands from contaminating your eyes because they can, theoretically at least, the viruses could, could come in through your eye zone. So don't touch your face in general, and, um, and that prevents all three modes, so the mouth, the nose, and the eyes from getting infected. In addition, you've heard a lot about physical or social distancing so that those droplets that we talked about would fall before you breathe them in. And finally, another way to prevent infection is to have antibodies after you're infected. So what is that? Antibodies are little fighter cells that your body makes after being infected, and they kind of linger in your body as a memory so they can be ready to fight the thing off the next time. Finally, for many diseases, you can trick your body into making antibodies by getting a vaccine instead of getting sick. So those are all sorts of ways that we can prevent getting the virus. We only cover our face, of course, because virus doesn't seem to really um, pass through your skin cells or through your pores, thankfully. And then we have three kids who asked a similar question here. So I put it into one question. Porter, age 10, and Kevin and Alexander, ages 11, um, they had questions along the lines of, when will we have that vaccine that you were just talking about? Well, um, also a great question. Having a vaccine, I think, is going to be very important to stopping the spread of disease. And scientists all over the world are working very hard on that right now. It's obviously a very important thing. But I think it'll be months to maybe a few years. Hopefully, hopefully not so long, hopefully within a year. But I don't see it... Um, happening right away. It takes a long time, sometimes decades, tens of years to develop viruses to things. And because it has to be safe, they have to make sure it's safe. They have to make sure it's effective, that it actually works and that it lasts a long time. And then that it doesn't create other bad things, you know, other side effects that would make it sort of dangerous. And that takes a while before they can sort of decide that, yes, we can let this be given to thousands and millions of people. And then Michelle, who is 11, she wants to know if they do find a vaccine for COVID-19, um, will kids need to get it also? Well, I would say you probably guess the answer is yes. Since kids are often together in schools and all your different activities, they tend to spread viruses about pretty well, especially since for this one, kids don't often look sick like we talked about, right? And also, many kids have either little baby brothers and sisters or grandparents living nearby both of which are more vulnerable to getting sick. So it'd be important for kids to get vaccinated too, to protect their families as well as themselves, like they do for other things. And then um, Josie, age 11, I'm gonna fill you in here. I know Josie. <laughs> she may live in my house. Um, what are the symptoms of COVID-19 and why is COVID-19 only just here now? Great question. So symptoms, what we found as these months have gone by is that people can have a lot of different kinds of symptoms. Most people have some combination of fever, cough, or trouble breathing. But as we said, some people don't have any symptoms. Other symptoms you can have are similar to things you get with other viruses like headaches or muscle aches, sore throat, and rarely like nausea or tummy pain, diarrhea, or runny nose. This virus is interesting in that um, a few people have reported loss of able to smell or taste, which um, in combination with some of the other symptoms might make your doctor a little more suspicious of COVID-19. As to why it's here just now, you know, viruses are around and changing and mutating all of the time. And it's just kind of a, a sort of just a bad luck sort of random event that has mushroomed into this big worldwide thing that we're, we're trying to get a hold of. So then um, Madison, who is age 10, do kids have different symptoms than adults? Yes. Um, as we said, many times kids aren't sick at all. That means they're asymptomatic. But when they compare sort of how many kids have fever, how many adults have fever, only about half the kids have fever and about seven tenths, almost three quarters of adults do. And that's similar for all the symptoms that we talked about, that they can have those symptoms, but they occur a lot less common. So kids might not look sick at all or just have a, a slight dry cough for a day or two. Um, adults, that can happen to as well, but the older you get, the more sort of typical um, flu-like the infection looks. 
And then um, Madison also wanted to know, is the most accurate way for testing using that swab? And by the way, I got that. And they call it a brain tickler for a reason. <laughs> Indeed. I have had it twice, negative both times, but it is, um, a, it is a real deal. Okay, so there's two kinds of tests. The nasal swab that we have, CAT, looks directly for little virus particles that are alive. So that um, those are most positive when you first have the virus. Maybe not on the first day, but day three, day four, first couple of weeks. And that's what is most widely available now, like at the, um, the drive-through at the hospital that the health center is doing. Um, so timing issues are um, sort of critical there because if you wait too long, we can't tell if that, that cough you had back in February was COVID by that nasal swab. It's looking for a virus that's been there real recently. The other kind of tests that you'll also start to hear talked about are blood tests to measure if you have those antibodies we talked about, sort of evidence that the virus has been in you and your body's responded and then your body's response. Antibodies aren't made right away by your body though. So that's kind of like the opposite situation where that's gonna pick up um, the COVID, evidence of the COVID maybe two, three, four weeks later. And if you take it too early, it could be negative, but really actually you really had the COVID. So is it the most accurate way? It kind of depends. All tests too, there's all different people making these tests and, and some of them are more accurate than others. With the antibodies in particular, some of those antibody tests are saying that you're positive when really what you have is antibodies to a, one of those four common cold coronaviruses that you had two months ago. So it can't tell one corona from the other. So we're, we're hoping that we can get some um, antibody tests that won't cross-react with other things. So yes means yes and no means no. <laughs> all the other wrinkle to all that though, is that we don't know if making those antibodies means you're still protected, which is of course the hope, but um, some viruses, you have it once, you have protection your whole life. Other viruses, like you know, like the flu, every year it's mutating a lot. And just because you got it last year doesn't mean you can't get it this year. So we haven't figured out quite yet which sort of camp that COVID is gonna fall into. And then Sam, who is age 11, do we have a cure for the coronavirus? And also, um, the, the next question was pretty similar too. So Caitlin, 11, when will there be a cure for the coronavirus? Well, um, we don't have a cure already. Um, when there will be a cure, we don't know. There aren't any cures yet, but we're learning a lot about how to help very sick people who come down with COVID and have to go in the hospital, for example. And most people don't have to go in the hospital. But because COVID's so new and yet such an emergency, Emergency. We begin with trying medicines that already exist. They're sort of trying to develop new ones. It's a little faster and to look at things that have already been used. So some of the medicines that they use uh, or they're trying are ones that fight similar viruses that are similar enough to COVID, like uh, you might have heard the word remdesivir. And others have worked in other diseases or help stop the immune system from going all berserk, like sometimes happens with COVID. And that's why hydroxychloroquine. Uh, had been tried. And then um, I have a couple extra questions that weren't from the kids since we have a little extra time. I was wondering if you would give us some really good tips for how we can stay safe. Like, why are we washing our hands all the time? Why can't we just wash them in the morning when we get up? Well, it sort of depends on where your hands have been during the day, right? So if no one has left your house in days and all those, any viral particles that got in are kind of kiboshed, then there's no coronavirus in your house. But typically, someone's going in and out, and um, so we should, wa we should wash like we normally do. We should wash before we eat, and after we eat, and after we go to the bathroom. And we're washing our hands more because if you have to touch something and you're not sure whether coronavirus is on it, you wanna wash them off so that, that soap could destroy any little viral particles that are on there. But if you're in the same house with the same stuff, and that stuff hasn't touched anything else, then you know at some point you have to be sensible. We can't have all of our hands just bone dry and cracked open from using soap and water 50 times a day either. So you have to find a balance that's, that's right based on kind of who and what you're in contact with and how often. 
And then the last question comes from the 11 year old sitting next to me on the couch. I realized that I, I love to watch Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci. I feel like they are the most important information right now because they're studying it all. And so they keep showing charts of, of a peak. And I keep getting the question, when are we reaching the peak? And I realize what she's thinking in her head is that the peak means we're done. So why does the peak maybe mean that we're not necessarily ready to go back to school? This is a great question. So have we peaked or not? We may have peaked. One of the things that we were seeing earlier it was going up so quickly that if everyone's sick at the same time, it would just overwhelm all the doctors and the hospitals from being able to care for everybody. So they tried to flatten that curve and instead of like a sharp triangle, make it kind of more like a really smooth hill. We may be at past the peak, like the middle, but it seems like it came on fast. And as we learned about how to stop it, it has slowed down, but the downhill slope is going to be taking a lot longer than the uphill, I think, precisely because we've been pretty successful in slowing it down, but there's still virus out there. So when we go back to school, it seems like it's going to depend on how far past that peak we are and what we have going in the meanwhile in terms of cures and vaccines and learning about it and how many... and how how long that immunity lasts and how many people we still think could get sick. Like how many people haven't experienced it at all. And so that's um, some of the different factors that are gonna go back to when we go back to school. It's a hard one to answer, but your schools are trying to figure out how best to do that um, in the meanwhile. Well, this has been Sonoma Kids Ask the, Ask the Experts. I have been talking with Dr. Smith um, from Sonoma Valley Pediatrician and I am your host, Kat Smith. And do you have any other messages you want to give to the kids before I let you go? Well, um, I would just say thank you guys for all these excellent questions and for helping to educate other students in the area. Hope that lots of students will listen in and um, just keep on looking for information and being curious and doing the right thing to protect yourself while we're, while we're getting this thing under control. Well, it's been very fun talking to you. I wish we could hug, but we'll just computer hug for right now. And so thank you <laughs> for having me on the show today. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.